Hello everybody, welcome to the source code walkthrough of the Break Arcade Games Out game. They were built entirely on a live stream and released on Steam. So this is kind of a, a, a live stream where I'm just going to explain uh, how the source code turned out. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm watching, I'm watching you now. Okay, thanks man. <laughs> we're going to do a source code walkthrough, so I'm going to show you guys what the end result was in terms of source code, how you guys can get it, how you can compile, how you can modify, and uh, to help you overall understand the source code if you're not up to watching the whole series. Uh, because in case you're, you're not familiar with what we did, uh, we started out like two months ago to create a game in C from scratch, entirely on a live stream. And we did the whole thing. I mean, we did software rendering for the game, then we did like a lot of gameplay, a lot of cool animations, juiciness and all that stuff, all the way to the Steam release, which was last stream. We finally, we finally finished the game. It was a total of like 81 hours of live streams, which is, uh, which is a lot of videos, but in terms of like creating a game from scratch and the engine and showing every system, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot in, in terms of information, a lot of cool, cool, cool information, right? <laughs> so, and this is the Steam page that you can guys, uh, that you guys can download the game for free. And also the source code. So the source code is here as a free DLC. You can cl click here and uh, download the source code. And once you do download the source code, you will have uh, this folder right here. Inside the game folder in your Steam uh, install directory, uh, Steam, Steam Apps, Common, Break Arcade Games Out, you, you get this code uh, folder. This is where the source code is. And this is the game. I'm just going to show you guys really quickly. In case you guys don't know, haven't seen, right? You can turn your volume up a bit. So this is the game we created on the live stream. It starts out as a breakout clone with uh, some nice animations and things like that, particle systems, everything we did, music and sound effects, everything we created live. That was pretty cool. You can watch the whole thing. And uh, then we added like power-ups to the breakout game. Oh, if I can kind of power up, yeah, there you go. So this is like when it's splitting, this is the comments power up, and these are powered down. But if I, I'm gonna have like negative consequences if I didn't. And then, the, the, the cool thing about the game is that it's like all, all, no, not all of them, but like a lot of arcade games, as if the mall were breakout. So this is like breakout power. And I, I have to, I still have to destroy like breakout rules. And this is like breakout Tetris. Yeah. And this is breakout Space Invaders. This one's nuts. Okay. So this is the game we created on the live stream. Okay, so uh, in order to build the game, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy both the code and the data folder. I can copy like the config as well to an empty directory. So I create an empty directory called Break Our Kick Games Out. I'm going to copy the code, the data, and the config. The source code uh, text file is just like the tutorial, but I'm going to show you guys here now. And the license. The license is like a uh, public domain and you can do whatever you want with it. So let me show you. So yeah, it's pretty much, you can do whatever you want with the, the source code, like learn, modify, make your own commercial games, copy, whatever. Uh, okay, now that I have the game here, I can build the game by running this build.bat. But uh, here's the thing, the build.bat, I can just run that through a command prompt like this. Uh, code build.bat, because it uses the, the CL command which is from Visual Studio, right? So I have to go to a Visual Studio command prompt. I'm going to type here. Oh, guys, let me just zoom in. So, yeah. So, guys, guys couldn't read, right? <laughs> they had a command prompt. That's okay. Uh, if I go to, like, the Visual Studio developer. Let's see. What is it, what is it called? Developer command prompt. Yeah, developer command prompt for VS. So, if I 
make one of these command prompts, then I can build a game. We can keep games out, code, build. There you go. But there are a ton of warnings and stuff. Uh, Yeah, that, that that's that's weird. I, what I can do, I think it pretty much built the game. Let me see. Oh, I didn't build the game. Let's take a look at that. But uh, oh, because that was thirty-two bit. Okay. Huh. So, <laughs> developer command prompt for Visual Studio. Sixty-four bits. Let me see if I can get. Uh, let me see if I can open that file directory here. Yeah, what I am gonna do which I advise you guys to do, is to open the vcvarsout.net file. Okay, so by making, by opening this on any command prompt, you pretty much make this command prompt a Visual Studio, and you can pass the x64 argument as a uh, argument to this shell, right? So then the CL command will work in the 64-bit version, which is the one we want. So there'll be no warnings, right? Uh, so I'm going to go through code and then build.bat. Yeah, perfect. So this is how you're supposed to build the game. And now there's like this build folder with the uh, with the executable here. But if I try to run the executable from this folder, it's gonna crash. Which is like we should have made that a little bit more, I don't know, safe in the sense, because you should have to you, you should uh, run through the base folder, not the code or the build folder. So from the base folder, I'm gonna run the, the executable. Then it runs perfectly. Or I can just copy that and put it out here, and then it also run. Okay, uh, but we are going to use like Visual Studio to debug and stuff, and then we can set the working directory to the base folder. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, but uh, so so that's how you build the game. So you have to make sure that you are uh, on a command prompt for Visual Studio set to 64 bits. Okay, so that's the first thing. Let me show you guys the script for the for the for this uh, command prompt. Just one second. Uh, yeah, so, so this is the script I run. Uh, I call my Visual Studio inst install folder sl at slash vc auxiliary build vc is all dot bat and I pass x64 as an argument. So when I call this guy, any uh, shell, any command prompt shell that I have open will be initialized to be able to compile using the CL. Uh, the compiler right for 64 bits so that's what we want so now you know how to build a game so let's start playing around with it now right so i'm gonna open for coder which is my editor of choice you can do whatever editor you want or visual studio if you want that as well let me show you the build file which is like the base file right so this is our cl command to 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 compile and we're compiling just one file we're compiling just the win32 platform.c this is a very cool way to do a Unity build, and uh, by compiling the platform file, this file pretty much uh, pretty much includes all others, like includes like utilities, math, string, uh, the game, the audio, the console, the software rendering, profiler, the assets, all the files, all the files that we can see here in the source code uh, here, and I have pretty much like one file from each major thing that we created. It started out just like the platform file. But then we have like the game, which is another important one. The, the game and the levels are pretty important. And then we have like the cooker for cooking our assets and the console for helping us print and stuff. And we have audio, which is a, another pretty pretty cool one. And our asset loader. And uh, in every every major system, you can watch the, the series here. So I'm just going to give you an overall idea for the, for the, for the code. And if you want to watch a specific system like, I don't know, Profiler, and then you can watch where we build the profiler, right? So that's the basic idea. Okay, so we have a ton of like helper, like helper of file function and uh, multi-threading stuff. And uh, and dealing with time, dealing with audio, we use like direct sound for the library and like more audio stuff and uh, like the full screen thing. And uh, here's, the, here's our main function. So the first thing we do, like load the cursor and uh, set the the, the period to one millisecond, so we can get like a good a good uh, sleep granularity, and then we pretty much just create our window. We create the window class, we register it, and then we pop the window. And then if we're not on developer mode, we make that full screen. 
then we get the frame rate that we should be running on and set up some uh, uh, some like timing stuff and here's the audio stuff and the audio we create a job queue and run that on parallel so that motor thread stuff that we just see went past in this uh, in this file this is where we use it we create the audio queue and uh, and then run update audio on that and uh, you can watch the whole episodes on audio especially like the last episode where we fixed and made that 100 percent that was pretty cool uh, okay, and then we, we create another thread, another queue that will be used for mo mostly our asset system, I think. And uh, that's it. And then we initialize our random state. So this is like the main, the main game, game loop, this while, through, uh, while running thing. So we set up the profiling for this, for this guy, and then we run the input, which is the first step. Right? First of all, I'm going to set the change to false, which is the way we did input. You can watch that on the first live stream. That was pretty cool. And then we're gonna run through all the Windows messages and get like window, Windows buttons, like mouse left, uh, mouse right. And then we're gonna process each uh, button that we care about, which is like, this is mostly for a debug, the, the, the right, left, up and down arrows. But then we have the ask, uh, the escape key, right? And some like uh, developer things and like F1, man. Did we implement all the four? Yeah, we did, here's all the four. <laughs> okay, and uh, okay, so the mouse inputs, now we're gonna get the get the cursor position. Then we're gonna change that to the right unit that we need, which is inverting the Y. And then we're just gonna get the delta. And if you if you remember, we had a hard time doing that in the first couple of live streams, and then we implemented this pretty cool system where we're gonna we're gonna lock the mouse in the center of the screen, right? By setting that to the center of every frame. But before we do that, we subtract and get the mouse DP. So the mouse doesn't get stuck here, we just get the delta, and then the game's gonna use that. We'll see that in a while. Okay, and uh, after that, we're going to update the game, which is the most important thing. We're going to see that. Here's the game going to run everything that it needs. And since we're using software rendering, we're also going to render here, like calculate the actual, the actual pixels and stuff. And then we're going to render the profiler if we, if we have the profiler enabled. Uh, if you don't, let me just open the, like, the profiler to see. Oops. The profiler. We just have like these functions doing nothing if we uh, if we don't have profiling enabled in our build up that uh, bad like developer and profiler. Okay, and then we after like rendering the profiler, we render that to the screen. So we have our buffer which we filled in our update game function. So this is the point where we actually send that to Windows and ask it to copy the the, the pixels to, to the screen. Okay, and at the very last moment we sleep through, well, if we should sleep, like if we're locked, we sleep to that amount that we should uh, sleep in order to, to have a constant frame rate, frame rate, which is good for animation stuff. So this is our main loop, okay? Which is pretty pretty straightforward, nothing too fancy. Now let's see how the game is structured, right? Uh, so the thing about the game, let me just go through the update game, and then I'm gonna see the auxiliary functions. Then the game starts out with a initialized, like this if here, this is like the start game function this if initialized here, if not initialized, right? So this is where we set up the like default values, like the game mode to the menu, and then we load the pack file so you can go like to the assets folder and see what happens when we load pack file. We get that from the OS. And then we make sure that the, the version is correct, that the number of assets is correct, that we have our like magic uh, word here and stuff. Uh, GA for game assets? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Uh, okay, then we load every sound and every bitmap. So like we have like load, load sound from pack. Uh, is that is that correct? There you go. So if we're like wave, we just load wave for memory. If we're like OGG, we load ADG async. We implemented that after we did jobs, and that was pretty cool. Implementing that async, you can watch that on YouTube. Uh, okay. Now we play the sounds, like the, the music and then like the background sounds. So, so some of them we set to zero, but we want them to be playing already because those are like the basic looping sounds, okay? Like the ball sounds, the power block sounds. Uh, okay, everything is good here. And this immutable sound is pretty cool. So uh, if you go to like the audio system, the immutable sound is something that sets like the sounds that when we try to reutilize the playing sound array, we're not going to go all the way from zero. Like it's not going to be like a full circular buffer. We're going to go from the immutable sound count to the last one, because we don't want to override like the music and stuff. But we can override 
like a like a small explosion that's pretty much done already, right? Okay, and then we load the save game, which is uh, pretty simple, like save uh, save game. The load game we pretty much just read the, the save file from the from that it's on the platform layer. Just read that pretty pretty easily. Then make sure the version is correct, and if it is, we just save that. Uh, we just copy that directly to our uh, global structure, which has like our level states. If it's locked and a high score, it's pretty easy. We did that pretty quickly. Same thing with the save, the load and the save, pretty easy. Okay, so load in. Let's go back. Okay, and then the, the config that's pretty cool. We did that pretty much. I think on the the not the last one, but the one before the last one, uh, the last developing, actual developing streams, they are this config file, which uh, parses and, and looks for like mouse sensitivity settings, window settings, locked FPS. Then we parse like bools and floats. We search for like true values, or we actually read floats. So that's pretty cool. If you want to watch uh, how, how we do like a small text file parser that reads floats and uh, bools. And you can, do, you can do this really, uh, to read ints pretty easily as well. That was pretty cool. That's in the config file here. Config. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so that's the game in it. So this is like the actual loop. So we first update the camera because the camera only moves through like screen shake. It doesn't follow anything. So we can update that right off the bat. There's no problem. Then we do like the play movement. And the play movement is based on the mouse. So first of all, we have the mouse DP. Remember that we got from the platform layer, the input struct. And these uh, structs are defined in the platform common file. So it defines like uh, what the input should look like, what buttons we need, has have some like macro helpers to like see if it's pressed or released or it's down and stuff. And also have like the, the, the basic audio and rendering services. So like whatever the game wants from the platform layer, it's specified here as like the function prototype. Okay, so like callback stuff and uh, read file and stuff. Okay. Uh, that, that's basically it in terms of uh, the communication between the platform layer and the game. And at this point, we update that, uh, we change that from pixels to world, and that's on the rendering. World, from the world. So we calculate that through this I expect multiplier. That's pretty cool. We did that in the very first day. We did this pretty cool system that uh, we can change the size of the window. And the game will keep like the basic 16 by 9 play area always on screen. That was pretty cool. So after we have the mouse in world units, we uh, we pretty much just uh, increment that our target P, right? So the target P is where the player wants to go, but we don't actually just set that because if you play the game, you actually see that we have like a wobbling movement on the that that was pretty cool on the like a uh, pretty cool animation, and that is this uh, spring thing. So calculate the desired. Uh, P, right, uh, for like the, uh, based on the target, let me just open that here. And then we do like the spring function, and you can see all that in the, our movement uh, stream. But it's basically like, we want to go to this uh, to this velocity, zero, and we have this velocity. And we want to go to this position, which is the player desired P, which is, which is uh, we did a collision on the wall, so we don't go all the wall, uh, go all the way <laughs> to the other side of the wall, right? And we are here in this position, and each one has a factor, right? a, uh, a factor that we multiply that by. And th these factors, we have like the movement feel. So if we want to play around with that, those are the values that we want to look for. Okay, and then we, we did like the basic equations of motion to calculate the acceleration, which is the DDP, the derivative of the derivative of the position, as well as the DP, the derivative of the position, which is the velocity and the position. If you want to know more about this movement thing you can watch. I have a tutorial on YouTube, which is pretty cool. Uh, like making our games feel awesome, the equations of motion. So you can learn all about all about the deep the DP, which is the velocity, and the DDP, the acceleration, how you can make that add friction and stuff, which makes your game a lot better to play around with. Okay, and the half size it's also also gives a like a, squ a squash and stretch feel. So these are the, the equations. Those are pretty much uh, Pretty much hacked in you know, these guys just to have a, a cool thing, and if you press the ask, we go we go back. We, well, if you're on the game uh, gameplay, we go back to the menu, and if you're on the menu, we said run into false and then return. Okay, and okay, so now if you are on the gameplay, if you are on a level transition, 
then we could run we have like the menu dot c and the menu not only has like the update menu which draws whatever the menu wants like the texts uh, see where, where, the, where the user clicked and stuff but uh, also has the transitions like the transition from level to the gameplay as well as the gameplay to the menu uh, those are, could probably be like uh, compressed into a single function but uh, well it worked pretty well and and uh, the idea was just have cool animations not have like the cleanest code ever and stuff okay so that's the basic idea for the transition and then, uh, and then we have the simulate level. So the way the game communicates, we have a base game, which is in the game.c file. And this game.c uh, uh, pretty much uh, deals with things that's common on all game modes. Like we have the player, we have the ball, we have the blocks, the basic block movements, right? And uh, the, the, that's on the game.c. And we have a levels.c, which deals in terms of the specific levels, because we have like the normal level, the wall, which has like the power ups, pong, tetras, and invaders. Okay, so if you want to add your levels, you can pretty much, uh, pretty much just uh, add another one here. And then if you change the menu as well, like the menu is here when we set the like the left mouse button. Here we set the, the change uh, current level to the hot level. Okay, and in this current level, we change, we set to this imam here and if you want to play around with that if you just add one more and set the current level to another enum you're gonna see like a uh, hey how are you doing bro all good all good around here how are you doing <laughs> uh, so if you just set the current level to another one you're gonna see a, a, a assert that you don't have like you don't have like a rendering and you don't have specific things so you can go like one by one and add uh, your level as well okay uh, let's see transition Okay, so 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 the this the simulate level is one of the hooks that uh, that the game has for the specific level. So if the specific level wants to simulate something here, like simulate some timing to make like the space invaders move, and this is where it's gonna it's gonna do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So after that, we're gonna simulate the blocks, and uh, we're also going to call simulate block for level. Because maybe the, the level wants to do specific things for the blocks. This is where the, the, the level has this hook here. And then we're going to update the balls. Uh, this is a, a pretty simple thing, but uh, we actually improved that a lot. Like we're doing AABB versus ABB for the player with a ball. And then if it does fly, like we add screen shape, increase the ball size. And this touchless bonus, which is a pretty bad variable name, is basically to reset the score. Because we have like a small multiplier whenever we uh, hit. And you can see all that in the level. Uh, and down here as well. Uh, one of the greatest tips just to set, like, you want, you want to know what touchless bonus d does, you just see where it's used. Like, here it's set to zero, so that's the only thing is in this file, so it's on the levels file. Okay, then we reset and reverse the ball. P this is also on the levels file and stuff. Okay, and then we decrease the number of triple shots if we do have, then we play sound. Okay, and uh, then we see the, the collision with the ball in the walls. Both, both left and right, and the top wall. Okay, and if the ball reaches the end of the arena, it's game over. Then we, we call the lose life, and this false is basically it's everything on the level as well. Let's lose life. Uh, if it's insta kill or not, then we add screen shake and see if it should insta kill or if it just uh, should uh, lose life life at the end of the frame. Okay, and this is the the more interesting part that we spend a lot of time on, which is the ball block collision, right? Uh, so for every for every ball we run through every block, valid block, and then we have a two ball block collision. And uh, I don't think it, that's in the collision to be honest. No, it's not just the AABB. Probably on the level two ball block collision. Yeah. And this is the this is the pretty cool uh, sweep we did. So we calculate the difference and we basically find out the inverted lerp to see where exactly we are in terms of the line. So let me just draw that for you really quickly. If we are here and we want to go here and we have a block here, we, we find out this point, which is the inverted lerp, right? I mean, this is like where we want to go. This is our beginning, right? So we find out the T based on the beginning and the end. 
then we can calculate the actual value in this point for the x and y, right? If you want to know more about that, you can watch the uh, watch the, pl the the playlist. Well, you have the collision. So we start our collision episode two, and we finish that. Well, I can't can actually see that. Beautiful playlist collision. So we start collision episode two. Then we finish that in episode 19, we have a review on the collision system. Uh, why aren't you coding this in JI? Dude! Dude, don't tease me, man. Don't tease me. I really want to code that on JI. I'm going to do tons of JI stuff, like tutorials for beginners, as well as cool live streams where we do all sorts of crazy metaprogramming stuff. That'll be pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But in the meantime, we're going to do like C and C++. We have to deal with that. So that, that's the sweep collision that we do. And, uh, and that's, basic, that's basically it. So if we hit a block, this is our, what we do. Like we add screen shake, we see if we have like strong blocks and review all, all this uh, inversion of the axes and stuff. So that's the collision. And then this is like the beginning of the rendering. We clear the screen. So if you go to the rendering, we have a clear arena screen. And this is pretty much like, uh, this is a pretty much our rendering in terms of like what it actually does. But I, uh, I could tell already trying out JI, but I would be lying. <laughs> Dude, he's taking his time, which is good, I suppose. But come on, <laughs> let us play around with it already, right? <laughs> this draw reactive pixels shows like the basic idea for the, for, the, for the system, right? So the basic idea is we convert the units from our world units to pixels. So we have like draw react and draw react in pixels. And then we just iterate through every pixel that we want to draw and just change the color. That's it. And we have like more advanced rendering, like transparent rendering, which is pretty cool. Like we do, do a lerp on the alpha. We have rotated rectangles. Let's see, rotated and transparent. So we do like a matrix multiplication. And we could like, we could do more stuff. Like we could do like uh, skewing and stuff pretty easily because we're just multiplying the matrix. Uh, and then we do the actual, then we convert that to pixels, then we do the actual collision test, so to speak, to see whether or not we should, uh, and we actually tested on uh, different things here. Uh, that was a pretty cool live stream we did, the rotated collisions. And then we did bitmaps after that. Hey, I was just wondering why you have such specific function names. Uh, are they more specific versions? Yeah, you know what? This thing wasn't the best call in terms of like design, uh, because we should probably have a more generic, well, the good thing about having such specific function names for the rendering, I only have that for the rendering, uh, is because it's more optimized. So the draw transparent rotated rect uh, is the one that's the, well, I'm not sure if it's the heaviest or if it's the draw bitmaps, the one that's heaviest. But since we don't need to draw bitmaps, uh, draw rotated bitmaps, we don't do like the, uh, well, we do? No, this is rotated rect. We do like, yeah, this is the draw bitmap. Since we don't have to draw rotated rectangles, we don't have to do like the, the matrix multiplication here, or the transparent things here. So this is more like an optimization, optimization thing, but it's not a very good call. It makes it really hard to port the range like OpenGL later on. I have tons of specific things. In the next game that we're gonna do on a live stream, we're gonna make uh, a more like suitable render API. Uh, no, I mean, in the other file, you mean here? Uh, like do ball block collision? Who wrote this code? A younger Casey? <laughs> well, I'll take that as a, the, the biggest compliment you could ever give me, right? <laughs> yeah, well, the thing about this file is that, like, let me take well, AABB versus ABB. That's pretty much the only collision thing we need. We could have called that, that like, is colliding and stuff. But we, we, we changed that a couple of times during the live stream. But do block ball collision. This is only used in this case. We could inline that, but since it's, like, really complex, I mean, not really complex, but kind of complex, we separate that into another function that was mostly optimization, but like place sound with variation. We have like place sound and place sound with variation. Those are the two ones we have. So the place sound with variation is just a helper around around place sound. Place sound is the, the one that actually does the work and place sound with variation just kind of sets some values. So yeah, it was kind of a aesthetic choice. I, I do like most of this thing, like add screen shakes, Pretty nicely, the place sound. I really like having the two of them. This is like just an uh, optimization uh, in terms of like code uh, structure, but the rendering, the rendering is not the, the best structure ever. 
uh, we're gonna fix that in the next game. It's gonna be better. Okay, and okay, so we did this. Okay, so after we start doing our rendering, right? We render like the first field, which is basically a series of transparent rectangles. Uh, okay, and then we draw the blocks. For every block, we just draw that. We have like subpixel. See, because since we did, we didn't add subpixels to every draw call, every draw call, so to speak, right? We have specific draw for subpixel. If we wanted to like rotate it with subpixel, then we, we would have like a heart attack. And that's why this render is not very nice to port because it has a ton of specific functions, right? So you are correct in this sense. I would agree on that. So the rendering uh, should have like less specific. But since it's software rendering and we didn't want to spend like a lot of time optimizing that, but we did have a pretty cool optimization stream later on. Like this live stream was pretty pretty funny. The one that we ran the profiler. But we didn't go all in in terms of optimizations. We just did the, like the very basic stuff. Then we optimize the power blocks and see that if they're colliding. Okay. Hello, how are you doing? Beast whales. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we changed the size. So we have like a size animation to make it grow. And that's one, one of the things that I did as a post launch update to make that more evident. That was pretty cool as well. And then we test it for colliding. If we are colliding, we just do a, a switch state, a switch statement on the size, and that's on the kind. And that's the great structure of like doing switch statements. It's pretty clean, I think. So like based on the on the switch, we do like implement like the number of triple shots or the visibility or the comment. So we set the comment and stuff. We play sounds. So that's pretty cool. And then, uh, well, this is like if we collided, right? And in any case, we're gonna do like the drawing for each kind. Okay, so that's the power blocks. And the particles, really simple. We just uh, have a ton of particles in our static array. And we actually released, thanks man. It was great releasing. And, uh, the greatest thing about releasing the game on Steam was that I did that on the live stream. That was a lot of fun. Oh, let me see, yeah, here. So you guys can download the game in the source code here on Steam. It was awesome. I did that on the live stream. That was super fun, man. And it's funny, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post the clip on YouTube the, the, the moment that I actually click the button and nothing happens, that was pretty funny. <laughs> it's already on YouTube though, the, the entire live stream. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So yeah, we just uh, decreased the particle life and uh, draw that as a transparent rotated rect. Another specific call, right? And uh, yeah, the ball rendering at this point, so we see if we need to play the sound based on the position to the player. Our sound system was pretty cool. If you wanna watch our audio systems, especially the beginning ones, which we add a ton of features, and then later on we start uh, debugging that to make it more robust. But we did like, it was a hack, but we did a stereo pan, which is, was awesome based on the player position. And we also have like, uh, most of the sounds increase their volume based on the player Y position, and the pan is based on the X position. Pretty cool. So then we see we have a trail, to end, we spawn like the trail particles and stuff. Yeah, see, uh, spawn the, the trail particles. Then we have more sounds, and here is the actual bottle rec uh, rectangle drawing, okay? In the wall, uh, drawing. So the wall has the same basic spring thing as uh, the player. Same thing. We have that for the player, the wall, and some of my transitions and stuff, and the camera shake, I, I believe, as well. So yeah. And this is like incrementing our variables, like the comments, front blocks, our timers. So this is our timer. We could have commented that. There are time timers increment that. So if we want to lose the life, this is actually where we where we do it. <laughs> where we lose the life, right? Uh, we play the sound, then we reset everything after the, the frame is done, right? So I suppose we have like one delay for, for dying, which is one frame delay, which is pretty much nothing, okay? And uh, yeah, so this is like the actual HUD drawing for the life. And uh, this is the actual HUD for like, do I have like triple shot stuff? This was, yeah, this was kind of a weird. Then we have a post simulate lab. So we have the simulate lab in the beginning of the frame, and at the end of the frame. We needed that for Tetris. We implemented that. Okay? And uh, it's, this is like the menu stuff. So if we're not on the gameplay, we're going to either update the menu or draw the menu transition. And like I showed you, the, the, the menu is pretty simple. All we have to, all we do is like, we draw a ton of texts here. The draw text, that was another pretty bad thing in software rendering. Since we, did, we didn't want to implement the whole font, rasterization, and, and stuff, we just like <laughs> drew squares based on each character. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty dumb, <laughs> but it worked, and it also had a cool effect because if you play, if you play the game, we just play the game once again. Well, let me just try to open that. If you play the game, you see that we have a pretty cool. Well, same thing. I have to 
pull that out of here. Uh, there's a cool animation of the text, see? That would have been a little harder to achieve if we uh, didn't have control over the individual rectangle on the text. So that's pretty cool. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so here's a timer based on the music to synchronize our menu stuff, which is pretty cool. We, every 16th note, we have like a menu animation. The player rendering, pretty much where we actually update that is uh, the DP based on the calculation we did earlier, right? Then we do the sound for, for the player and the actual player drawing here. Okay, and this like, these are debug hacks and stuff. Like, this is our profiler rendering. But this is actually our cheats. Like we have like more invincibility or to destroy a block and stuff. This draw message is the is the console thing, which is our print. Just for helps. It was great uh, doing that. And why do you structure like verb objects like draw bitmap versus objects verb like bitmap draw? Well, if I want to draw a bitmap, I think I should call like the draw bitmap function. Should I not? I mean, it sounds more intuitive to me. Like. So, as a series of commands, right? Like I'm doing, I'm like here and I draw a float, draw a message, and like is down, is pressed. Uh, well, block destroyed is a pretty bad name because it's the it's the, the past tense and stuff. It's actually be, yeah, it's supposed to be called if the block was destroyed. That was a pretty weird thing. But yeah, I kind of like to structure that because I think it may update menu, update menu. You pretty much know what the function does, right? The function updates the menu, right? You're asking to update the menu, right? Yeah, uh, bitmap draw doesn't make much sense to me unless you're thinking more of like object-oriented thing, like bitmap dot draw. In this case, that'll make more sense. I suppose probably that's what you're thinking. I wasn't very used to that. I did program a little bit in object-oriented land, but I wasn't a very good programmer back then, so I pretty much just deleted that and my brain started focusing on this uh, more like low-level programming stuff. So let me just take a quick look on the levels. Uh, just to show you guys how it's structured. So the basic idea we have like a, a level state, which is a union between each specific level has a state. So this, this space invaders has to keep track of the enemy P, the movement, whatever, whatever it needs, right? The Tetris is the one that has the most things. And uh, so remember the simulate uh, level. So pretty much just a sweet, uh, switch statement. And uh, in this in this case, we just uh, we do whatever we need, and we have to watch the specific uh, game modes to actually see how this gameplay code is structured, because some of them are pretty, pretty messy, some of them are pretty well structured. We did that in a couple first days, like beginning of game modes, and uh, catching some levels. That's where we did most of them. And then we have the, the Tetris one. I don't know what it's called. Yeah, level design and gameplay programming. So this is where we actually implemented that. So if you want to learn more about the gameplay aspect, how do you add a new level, these are the live streams that you want to take a quick on. And, but that's the basic thing. We have these hooks. We have the simulate, the post simulate, and the block, like simulate block for level. Okay, which is like maybe the Tetris block can do like crazy stuff, like rotate this frame and stuff. Bitmap in bitmap draw can be viewed as the object and the draw is the action. Kind of like object. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you're, if you're thinking about object oriented, bitmap draw makes more sense, right? But I'm not. I'm more thinking about commands in this case, like draw a bitmap, drop this bitmap, this bitmap for me and stuff. Doing it like object work makes it more clear where the code is coming from because you could uh, subdivide it in modules, as well as doing a module object for. Yeah, I suppose if you have like a, a pretty big code base, you would probably have to structure module uh, object verb. But renderer draw bitmap also makes sense to me. So renderer bitmap draw. It kind of sounds inverted, but uh, I don't know if you're more if you're more used to object -orient, oriented programming. Uh, yeah, a bitmap draw makes a lot more sense, I suppose, in this in this sense. I don't know, but it's more of a style thing. Uh, yeah, a lot of people questioned some of my style choices, like having struct type def the name at the end. I really don't care about that. When JI comes out, that uh, we were teasing that uh, a while back, I'm probably going to have to change my entire style to make it more like JI focused. So I don't really care much about that. Uh, I care about like the high level structure, right? I mean, having switch statements like this and the, the hooks and where I add those, more like naming and stuff. But yeah, mostly it's just like doing a switch statement for, for each game mode. And uh, I suppose that's it. I think I'm gonna end the formal stream 
I'm gonna stay a while for more questions, but I'm not gonna record that because I want the YouTube video to be a little bit shorter, like 40 minutes. We're pretty much coming to 40 minutes now. So I'm just going to say goodbye, <laughs> okay? Uh, so if you wanna if you wanna learn more about the game, you can go to my YouTube channel and watch the entire development here. We have the playlist, which is making a, a game in C from scratch. And we also have the game on Steam, which you can download for free, as well as the free source code. I also like doing the type F at the end. It was something you introduced me to. Oh, that's awesome, man. <laughs> I don't actually know where I learned that. I think I think I, I switched from C++ to C, and that was like a compile error for not having the property thing set up. And I kind of see, well, if I do this way, it's going to work for C and C++, it's going to work. And then I just basically, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Let me just do that. I didn't actually think about that. Before I was doing type F struct, name of struct, yeah, at the end, yeah. That's what people ask me, like, why don't you do this way? I said, I don't know, man, could, I could do it this way. Uh, I, really don't, I really don't get too attached to these kind of things. Uh, but hopefully you can now download the source code to understand and play around and have uh, some fun with it, right? I'd love to see what you do with it. You can even make your own games based on that, just use the engine, just use the rendering, whatever. And I re even release them commercially, like doing parts, right? That would be pretty cool to see. And uh, if uh, subscribe, subscribe to my YouTube channel, you'll be able to see... Uh, my new projects, which involve more complex games, probably more complex tutorials and live streams. I also have some pretty cool stuff, like I have like the how to make a program, uh, how to program a game in C++ for beginners, which is pretty cool, right? And now that the game is released on Steam, when I have to think about a harder thing to tackle. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll see you next time.